Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Foreman Community Demo. Uh, I'm stepping in for Melanie today. Unfortunately, I cannot broadcast this live, uh, but those of you who are joining us on the Google Meet can ask questions there or on uh, Libera Chat, the Foreman. Uh, those of you who are watching later can ask us on the chat uh, or on in the YouTube comments uh, or open a topic on discourse. So a few quick updates from me. Uh, the first is FormanCon. We're going to have FormanCon at um, the third week of November this year. And we have the call for papers open. Um, you can see that on discourse. It will be closed on November 2nd, so we have time to uh, get the agenda ready. So please go ahead and add your ideas. It's going to be on the 15th and 16th of November and uh, virtually, obviously. And a few versions that came out uh, right now, uh, Foreman 2.5.4 and Catello 4.2. Thank you for everyone testing the release candidates for Catello. And now let's move to our demo. Those are all of my updates. So our first presenter today is Mark. So Mark, to you. All right, thank you very much, Ori. So you should now see my screen. Uh, so today I'll start with something small, uh, even though it was quite a lot of work. And that's going to be some improvements on our provisioning templates. So uh, if you look at the default installation, maybe with some plugins, you would see that we have more than 100 of provisioning templates. And that includes all the snippets. And there are some weird names like, <clears throat> you know, this uh, Alterat or default or Altriast. And no one actually knows what, what they're used for, except for a few people uh, who use them. Um, there are some more prominent, like Kickstart or Precede, but uh, there are some some that are less known, let's say. And um, what we tried to do is we documented uh, where these templates can be used or how they how they are used. So if you now open a template, um, it contains some description that you can find in here. So for all preceded templates, uh, we added some description, which gives you at least some brief information about what it does, where it's used, what parameters it can take. Um, it is also uh, stored in the metadata in here, in this section. Um, I'll talk about it in a second. But uh, this should be now available basically on, on all templates. Um, if we look at Windows, you can also see that there are some examples. Uh, or there are usually some links where you can find more information. Maybe that's going to be better uh, to show on the Kickstarter template. Uh, probably the one that everyone is familiar with. but. Uh, yeah, here you can see some documentation about the parameters that the template actually uses and some uh, some reference links uh, to the documentation. Um, given it's in the, in the description, if you actually decided to clone the template to customize that, it would clone with that as well, so you can update your description easily um, uh, if you add, for example, some new parameters or something like that. Now, you may say that this is somehow duplicated right now. Uh, we have it in the description field in here and also in the metadata that we that we have in the beginning of the template. And there is some work in progress uh, to actually store the metadata outside of the of the content of the template. So this will disappear at some point, uh, but probably not in the 3.1. Uh, but 3.1 is the release where you should get these default descriptions or descriptions for the default templates. So that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing I would like to show is uh, some improvement uh, on our permission system. So let me navigate to, um, to the configuration report first. So this is the page where you see the configuration reports for, for hosts. And uh, we edit a way how to filter them by the, uh, by the user uh, who owns the host for which we see the reports. If you're not familiar with that, I'll just quickly show how the on ownership of the host look like. So in this instance, I have several machines. And let's take a look at the edit form of this host. Um, 
responsive loads. There's additional information tab in here, and you can set who is the owner of, of a given machine. So in this case, I've selected user, limited user. And if I go to this reports page, uh, I can now filter by host owner ID. So I could say something like, I want to see all reports for machines or hosts that are owned by the user with the ID for that should filter reports. The same way I can filter by another ID too, just to demonstrate that. And I can also use something like this current user. And that, as you can imagine, translates to the ID of the currently logged in user. So in this case, this is the user with the ID for, this is the admin user I'm currently using. Um, why this is useful? Uh, you can use the very same syntax in the uh, in the filters in our permission system. So I have created a role um, that takes advantage of that. Let's see the filters definition. Uh, you can see I added filters to view reports and even view ARF reports, which are coming from OpenSCAP, also view hosts. And I limit all of them using this current user uh, current user syntax. Now, I've created also a user um, with this role. Uh, it's here, demo two. So I will impersonate that account. And let's see how it looks for that user. So if I go to the host page, I see that I, as this user, own these four machines. As we've seen, I, I've showed that the first one is owned by this account. And now if I navigate to the config management reports, I will only see my reports, basically. And even if I try to do something like uh, host owner ID four was the first uh, account, I will not see any reports like that because I'm limited to only my reports. Now, the current user doesn't work for all the filters. It always needs a, an explicit definition. It needs to be defined from where I actually get the information from. And it's probably only meaningful if you have an owner of some resource. For reports, it's, it's quite clear it's coming from the host. Uh, for which you have received the report, uh, but it doesn't work everywhere automatically. The similar con concept is there for tasks, and in future we would also like to have that for audits. So, for example, the user could only see the changes that they performed, but not any other. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. There's one more thing. Um, you may also think about what if some user actually picks the login current user. Uh, because we can also search by, by login like that. So we've uh, added some, some uh, limitation there. If someone would like to be called current user, it should actually uh, say it is, once it submits the form, it should say it is reserved keyword. The only problem would be if you already have a system where is some user with the current user login, then this user becomes invalid. And basically, you need to uh, modify, the, modify the login first. And that is all from me. Any questions? I don't see any questions in the chat. If anyone here has a question, they can jump in. If not, the next presenter is Leosh, uh, who also has two demos. So Leosh, to you. OK, let me share this. Let me share the screen. All right, now you should see my screen. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, today I got two small things to share with you. First one is new template snippet called package manager. Um, it's for detecting uh, which packager is used on the system. As you can see right now, we can detect for Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, RHEL families. It's there, it depends on which version. Arch Linux and for SUSE Dumbleweed. So if you need to detect package manager in your templates, please feel free to use this, this snippet. Um, also, all contributions for extending the list of the supported OS more than welcome. And yet, yeah, that's basically it. It's a really small snippet. And second thing what I wanted to talk about is uh, global registration. Uh, recently, P one PR got merged where we are uh, removing using Catalo CA consumer RPM. Right now, we extracting the logic to the template. So, what we do is that we configure the subscription manager manually, also run some updates and installs. 
and register the host without any need to download the RPM and install it from the satellite. So uh, the registration process from user view is basically same, no changes there. If I show you the script, the generative script, you can see that uh, he will be actually cleaning up all catalog C consumers. Then we install or upgrade a subscription manager, do some configuration to point it to foreman or to foreman proxy. And yeah, did some do some configuration under and run the registration. So if I will run the script. Uh manager is downloaded, install it, and now it's trying to register to my Catal instance, and yes, system is registered. So as I said, uh, from user point of view, no changes, everything should work as before, but without need to download uh, the Catal C consumer RPM. And that's everything from me. Thanks, Nayash. Give people an opportunity to jump in if they'd like. Okay, moving on to Samir. Hey, uh, good morning. So let me try presenting my screen here. There you go. So today on my agenda are a few updates around the new content view UI. So the first thing I wanted to share was that the new content view UI is now the default content view landing page. So if you navigate from content to content views, this will now navigate you to the new UI. Uh, And so also for uh, at least one release, uh, we'll still have the old content view available under the legacy URL. So if you go to legacy slash content views, uh, you can still see the old URL. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so the second thing I wanted to demo was the ability to add errata filters by date and type. So when you create a filter for errata, you have two options. One is by ID, another one date and type. So let's go ahead and create a date and type filter. And once you create it, this is what you'll see. So uh, the thing about uh, date and type filter is it's just a query that is sent. So you can basically select the types of errata to be saved. Uh, excuse me for a minute. I need to... All right, sorry about that. Uh, let me continue here. So uh, yeah, when creating an errata by date and type filter, you're presented with a screen like this. And what you can do here is select some criteria for the errata filter. Uh, so the options are to select the type of errata. You can select uh, any of these three and you also get an option to select a date. Uh, it could be the issued date or updated date. So this is what your errata rule will look like. So uh, you have these chips here to tell you what the rule exactly is, and you can edit the rule and save the settings. Uh, we have the same uh, search filters on errata by ID. So let's look at a Irata ID filter. So the 
the data bike ID filter lets you uh, explicitly add uh, iratas to your filters. So this uh, goes with the add and remove flow, but you have this uh, these filters to basically filter down what you need to add. So you can still run these filters here. So this is exactly, this is fairly similar to what you'll see on the uh, other one. So you can run filters on dates and go ahead, add mm. things here. So this was what I had to show around <coughs> filters. Now let's move on to deletion. So we have added the deletion flow to content views. So the way you do that is you go to a content view and you have the delete in the actions. So when you try to delete a content view that has been published and promoted and also has affected hosts and activation keys assigned. So these are all these steps you'll see. You can look at all the versions and where they're published and promoted to. You can also get a count of hosts and activation keys that are assigned. And so this tells you all the versions that will be removed. The next step, if you have any hosts assigned, so for my example, I have one host assigned to this content view I'm trying to delete. So what you can do is move this host to a different uh, content view. So let's try moving it to content view one. You'll have the same flow for any activation keys that you have assigned to the content view. So let's move this to the same content view. On the review screen, you will get all the information on what you're trying to do. So it tells you all the versions will be removed from all environments. And if you're moving hosts and activation keys, uh, you can go ahead, delete the content view. being just a little slow. So while this happens, I can move on and show a couple of things here. So the next thing is breadcrumbs. So we added some <coughs> breadcrumbs, which also go levels deep. So for example, I can click here, go back to the content view. The default tab is versions. Uh, I can go inside a version and that will include all the version tabs. And as I navigate through the versions, you can see uh, changes on the breadcrumbs. So that was one small part there. All right. Let's see. Uh, all right, I created a lot of content views here. All right, this task is still running. All right, while this deletion happens, let's move on to the next part of it. So the next, uh, what I need, I wanted to demo was bulk adding content views to composite content views. So this is a composite content view. You can tell that by the icon here. And the way to bulk add content views to component uh, composite content views is to select whatever content views you mean to add, and then hit this add button. That will take you to a screen that looks like this. So I had three content views that I wanted to add. And you can select what version of the content view to add. In case you have an unpublished content view you are adding, the update to latest version will be checked by default and it will pick up whenever a new version is published. And you can go ahead, add these. 
and you can see those got added. And oh, I already have a lot of things added, so I'm assuming it got added. All right, and while we wait for this, all right, it seems to have finished. Okay. So let's check that out. We should not have a CV344. Right. Yep. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, next thing on the list is uh, user permissions. So let me demo that quickly. So I have a user here who has read only permissions. So let me impersonate him. And so on the content views page, you have this create content view button. You have some actions here. So let me refresh this while impersonating the user. All right. So since the read-only user does not have create permissions or edit permissions, so all the actions are hidden, the create okay. content views button is hidden. If you drill down, you don't have the publish button here. You don't have any actions for versions, example, promotion, removal. You cannot add or remove repositories. So basically the whole UI becomes read only in case the user doesn't have required permissions. All right, that was all I had for today. Thank you, Samir. Um, we have two more demos about the new view UI. So next up is Andrew. Oh, Mark raised the hand. Uh, Mark, did you have a question first? Yeah, yeah, I would like to ask you, Samir, one one thing. So first of all, I like the UI. It's really nice, and I think I'm I'll get used to it very quickly. But just in case. Um, if user would prefer to use the old UI, you mentioned there is this legacy URL I can access. Is there a way to get to it through the UI so I don't have to type the URL manually? Uh, no, there isn't. So you have to manually type in the legacy URL. OK. Hello, everyone. OK, I'll share my screen here. Just one moment. Hey, you should be able to see a content view. Yeah, you can see it. Great. OK, so I have a bunch of very small changes that I have uh, introduced in this last, uh, in last sprint, last two weeks here. So I'll go ahead and look at those right now. Um, so first, a very simple one on the Create Filter page. So here is the old UI, if you're not very familiar. If you want to add a new filter, this is how you would do it in the old UI. This is for a content view. And then when you're inside of a content view, if you're adding a filter. So that's where I am in the old UI. Here's the new UI, just for some context. So if I create a filter here, there was a ticket to update this so that when I create the filter, if I wanted to you know, create an awesome filter for this content view. I would just press the enter button and it will be built. So that uh, was done this last sprint, <laughs> the enter button of functionality. So that's all for that little tiny ticket. And I'll move on to the next one. And we are going to be adding that functionality anytime you see a modal across the site. So hopefully anytime you have entered something in a field and you want to just smash that enter key, it should allow you to submit. OK. Next ticket, um, now I'm going to look at the filters page. Uh, this is 
within that content views uh, view. So right now I'm looking at a, a content view and I have a list of filters. Uh, this one doesn't actually have uh, that many in here. Oh, sorry, I'm already too far down. Okay, so here I am looking at my different filters and I'll go back and do that here. And I have this filter Steve that I'm going to open. And here's the old UI. Sorry if I'm jumping around a bit too much. So this is what you would see if you're editing a filter on the old UI. Here's the new UI. And I've changed two things here in this last sprint. I have made the name and the description editable. So you can go ahead and edit this. We're also following a slightly different paradigm with uh, how we're editing. So if you have two things here to edit, if you attempt to edit both of them at the same time, because it's a single request, we don't allow that. So we'll close whichever one you have uh, currently opened to prevent you from you know, thinking that maybe you changed something here. And if this was open at the same time and you sent the request, you'd expect that to be saved too, and it would not have been. So this kind of gets around that functionality. So yeah, um, so that's the first bit is just to change the name and description and make it editable. The second is this little drop down you see here is all added or not added. Now, these are slightly different naming strategies from what we have previously. Um, if you go to our wonderful filter Steve here on the old UI, you see add and then list remove. So these are the ones that have been added. So we've changed that a little bit to make it uh, slightly more well, understandable in a way. So we always show all of them, and then we just have the status on the table. And then if you want to see the ones you've added, you would just select that. And right now, we don't have any added. So if I was to add one, I presume you'd have more than two of these. You can then filter down by those. Okay, so those are the other two little bugs that I finished up this last two weeks. And then the last one, let's jump over to the version details view. So I'll just go back to my main content view here to navigate down into this so that you can see how to get there from the old UI and the new UI. So I'm on our content view list. I'm going to jump into a component content view just because I want to see a, a larger list, let's say, in my version view. So now I'm in versions. I'm going to grab a 3.0. And I have this kind of like horizontal view here in the old UI. And we've changed that pretty significantly in, in a previous patch. So if I go, oop, no, moving too fast, doesn't like it. OK, so if I click on 3.0 here, this is what the new UI looks like. So we are on the same screen in the old and new UI. So we just have a horizontal and vertical difference here for the tabs. Um, the, what I added this week, though, in the new UI was this all repositories drop down. And you do see this on the uh, old UI as well. So if we go somewhere like yeah, repositories, um, no, Let's see. OK, here you go. So on the old UI, you have this, this selection tab to actually choose which uh, repositories you want to filter by. Um, so we've just added that to the new UI as well. So if you go into any of these, you can see you can filter by those repositories. And then, yeah, it'll reduce it down. In the case of only having a single repo associated with the, all of the same files, you're only going to see the associated repo. You won't be given the chance, the choice anymore to select because you don't really have a selection to make. All right, that's all I have to share with you guys today. If there's any questions, let me know. Okay, if there is no questions, uh, the last bit for the new content view UI, Chris Roberts. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. This will be a, just a quick one. Um, so what we've done is uh, 
I went ahead and added the file. So right now on the old content or the before this, you would just have repositories and you would see that you would have a file repo and you can click mm -hmm. files and so forth. Um, but now what I've added is actual files. Now you can actually see the files that you have. So if you click files, you can actually see the, the name and the path, which is what we returned. We have auto search. Uh, we have the repo that we're doing. We have auto search, so we can search if we have multiple uh, pagination. And then if we click on the actual file, um, it will take us to the, takes a moment. Um, it will actually take us to the file on the content side. And we can see that the library repositories that's in this, um, and then in the content views. So um, that's pretty much all I had. Let me stop sharing. Thanks. I don't see any questions in the chat. So moving on to Ryan. Thanks. Let me share my <clears throat> screen here. Um, so I'm going to show a new content browser. Um, right now, it only works for Python packages, um, but it will more content types will be added to it in the future, and it's actually really easy to do that. Um, and I'll show first. I'll show the all this from a user perspective, but at the end, I'll, I'll take a minute to show um, a little bit of the code just to. Uh, show like why it's easy to add support for a new content type. Um, so this is the this is the browser. This is the listing for it. Um, in order to get here, you just come over to other content types under this content types heading. Um, so you can see you can select a type. In this case, it's only Python packages. You can see many many NumPy packages here. Um, as well as their versions and their file names. Um, this is paginated. You can change the number per page. Um, this is all searchable. In my shelf reader packages, there are two of them hiding in here. <clears throat> so that's the that's the listing. Now, if I go and I click on one of these, um, let's say this one. Now we're in the details page. So there are two tabs here, details and repositories. This is the repositories tab. Um, so you can see there's the repository name, product name, uh, the last time this repo was synced, and the number of Python packages uh, in the repo. This is also searchable. Let's see. I can search for a repository. Obviously, there's only one here, but um, and then there's just the details tab, which is um, just some of the metadata in this case name, version, and file name for Python packages. Um, you can also see there's breadcrumbs up here that takes you back to the listing. Um, so that's the 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 um, content browser UI from the user perspective. And now I just want to take a second. Um, and show the code and just explain um, why, uh, why why that's significant. So going to switch now over to here. Um, so you can see this file here. Um, this is a config file for that browser. And so um, what you saw in that browser in both the listing and the details. Um, that information was um, kind of generated by this config file. So basically, the, the implementation of all those things um, reads from this file to kind of figure out what to display. So here you see like all the ways you might spell Python packages. Um, you can see here, this is this section here. These are the 
the columns in the listing. So we had name, version, and file name. Um, if you wanted to get rid of one of those columns, you could just delete this from here. Uh, if you wanted to display something with a particular React component, you can just do that here. Uh, similarly down here, you can see the tabs on the details page. So um, before we saw details and repositories, if you wanted to add another tab to that page, you would just um, add it to this list of tabs following a similar structure. Um, and again, you can even change uh, the, the column headers on, in those tabs. Um, you can choose to render information with a different React component, um, all from this configuration file. And so for any other content types, um, what you would do is just um, add another uh, configuration object to this list and just kind of put in the information you need for that content type following a similar structure. Um, and there's actually already a PR to add Ansible collections uh, to this browser. So yeah, um, but that's all I had. So yeah, thanks. Thank you, Ryan. And I don't see any questions. Uh, so now we have three demos about the new host UI. Amir, you're first. One second. Sharing my screen. Okay, you should see my screen now. Um, so Basically, we have some um, small enhancements for the host detail page. So this is the Amir, order. could you make it a little bit bigger? Um, yes, this um, sure. I just want to be focused on this button, new UI. Um, so basically, um, now um, you don't need to activate the experimental lab in order to just sneak peek the new UI. You can just click on the new UI button in the um, old page. And it should render the new um, host detail page. So as you can see, we have some enhancements like this new experimental banner at the top. You can switch back to the previous UI. Um, and also you can share your feedback. And this leads to our community discourse, a, a specific thread for the new host detail page. Um, also, you can switch back to the previous UI and share feedback directly from the kebab dropdown, as you can see here. There are also some um, um, changes, small changes in the kebab dropdown. So um, we have icons um, and we fixed all the bugs, including uh, the edit buttons, the edit button and clone delete, etc. Also, some alignments issues have been fixed. Um, and all of these enhancements uh, will be in Foreman 301. I also wanted to show uh, this new uh, this new um, power operations dropdown. So this is a new feature. It's not part of this enhancement. It's not part. It, it's not part of a uh, 301. But I couldn't um, um, show that because my environment is broken up. But I will. I will demonstrate it in the next demo. And um, this power operation. So basically, you can uh, restart. You can turn off, turn on your host directly from the details card. Um, that's all I have to share about these enhancements. And um, thanks. Back to you, Ori. Thanks, Amir. Hoping to see the rest at the, at the next demo. Uh, next up is Jeremy. Thanks, Ori. Let me share my screen here. So continuing on with the uh, host detail attachments from the Catello side, um, got some improvements to show you today to the traces tab. This time around, we've added two things. Uh, we've added enable traces and restart by remote execution. So first enable traces. 
what what we're doing is we we actually detect if the Catello Host Tools Tracer package is installed on your host, and if it's not installed, then we show you this beautiful uh, screen here. And uh, when you click this button, you'll see this modal. You can enable Tracer from here. And uh, what this does is it actually starts a, a remote execution package install job. And uh, you can see here, install package, Catello host tools, Tracer. And uh, it's installing on, on the host via remote execution. We can see that's already done. So let's go back to our host page for the same host and back to the traces tab. And now we will see that we have all of these traces that we can resolve. Now in the last demo, uh, we already showed you uh, that you can do this. You can select multiple items and you can hit the restart app button. That's the same. Uh, what we've added are these action menus. So you can choose either restart via remote execution uh, that's the same as this button here. Um, or you can restart via a customized remote execution. And the customized remote execution will take you directly to this job invocation form. We've added a new uh, job template called Resolve Traces. And the convenient thing about this is it just takes in the trace IDs and they're filled in for you. So. From the screen, you can customize anything else that you want to. You can execute it now, in the future, whatever other changes you want to make, and then submit. And it will resolve those particular traces that you've selected on your host. And uh, it's usually pretty quick. It's already done here. But I want to show you this. If we look at the host task, what it's actually doing is that this is the script that it's running on the host. It, it just runs these two commands and then uh, uploads the tracer information. So uh, with the new job invocation template, you, you don't have to worry about assembling. We didn't have to worry about the assembling these helper commands on the front end, which really worked uh, well for us. Um, a couple other things I want to mention. Uh, if you have a Let's see. If you have uh, session type traces like this one here, you might notice that they're not selectable. So even when you go select all, this one's not selected. And that's because we, uh, we're we unable to re resolve that type of trace remotely. There's also a note about that here. And then finally, anything that requires a reboot, um, it doesn't bother assembling the helper commands for you. So. You see I've selected two here that are regular daemon type and one static where you have to reboot the computer. And you'll see if I go restart those via remote execution, the script that it builds for me is just going to say, it's just gonna say reboot, this, this command will reboot it in one minute. And so it, it doesn't bother assembling those other helper commands. So that's what we've added to traces uh, for this sprint. Uh, any questions, I'm available here or IRC. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. And moving to Partha. All right, I think I was on mute. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, let's let's go to the UI here. So Jeremy last week showed this new errata screen we had last sprint, you know, last demo showed the errata page. Uh, so if I go to I go to all hosts, new details page. Okay. So, so Jeremy, I showed that you can expand and, and it'll show you prop packages and information about stuff. Uh, what we added this print was this apply button. This was disabled. And 
and what we also added was you can see you can, there's a new option to select everything across all pages uh, so you can so we now we have facilities like we can say select everything across all pages we can uncheck individual items we can if i go to the next page i can uncheck select a few and it keeps track of exactly what got unchecked uh it also you can also clear everything uh and you can select page as that that was already there but it's still i just want to show it's there uh so you can so let me select a couple let me select a couple here one two here and the third one on this page okay so when I apply right now, the apply is only by a Catello agent. So you need Catello agent installed on your client. Uh, then you can freely apply uh, and it will it'll apply all this errata. Uh, I'm not sure my Catello agent is running, but let me, let's, let's look at that. Yeah, I was, ha I was having some trouble with the agent, but uh so as you can see it says it's trying to apply these three errata uh and okay yeah because i think my my system is down so anyway uh but that's the new functionality we have now in errata apply that you can you can select errata and apply it uh, yeah that's pretty much what i had Thank you, Partha. I don't see any questions, so we're going to move to the developer-focused demos. We have two of those. Dominic, you're first. OK, hello, everybody. Uh, I will share my window. Um, OK, so uh, everyone uh, knows uh, that uh, we are also, the format also works with facts, and facts are some kind of information about posts. These informations are uh, gathered by uh, some configuration tool like Puppet, Ansible, Sal, Chef, you name it. And uh, for a long time, um, we have different types of fact parsers. Right now, we have also different type of parsers because every every this conf every configuration tool has a different uh, format or construction of that uh, fact report let's say and uh, the only way that you can register this kind of fact parser for several several uh, tools uh, you should use the method called fact, uh, fact parser dot register fact parser and uh, this is not ideal way how to register something in the format so i created a fact parser registry uh, that's uh, that's usually is just a hash uh, hash with key and respective object that uh, is used for the parsing so uh, you can register the fact parser by this let's say this uh, uh, this command and this is the register for a key puppet so if it's if you if the foreman gets a report from puppet it used the puppet parser for parsing this fact report uh, and still says uh, that is used for uh, in, the, in the default manner so that means if the foreman doesn't found any uh, parser for uh, for given key is just use the default one. In this case, it will be the puppet one. Uh, and uh, also, uh, in the in the initializers, uh, we are using this uh, this importers to uh, this parsers too. Uh, so uh, if you if you have some plugin that use these parsers, please use the use the fact parser registry. 
because in the future version, this this calls from the fact parser will will be removed. Uh, right now, it just prints the deprecation message and uh, register the fact parser in the new way. But uh, please don't uh, please don't belong on this calls. And uh, that's all from me. So the two doors. Thank you, Dominic. And our last demo for today, Amir again. Okay, share my screen. You can see my screen now. Okay, so in the host detail page, as you can, as you may know, um, we need to extend it from plugins. So currently you can extend it and uh, you can add cards to the overview tab, you can add tabs from plugins, and now you can also add content to the kebab dropdown. So as you can see here, I have extended button one and two directly from a plugin. I will show you how it looks. Behind the scenes, it uses slot and fill. And let me show you how, how does it work. So in your global JS file, just add a global fill. The ID uh, for the slot is host details kebab. Uh, you need to give your fill a key. Um, and also the content itself. So as you can see, um, I have drop down separator and items. Um, you can wrap um, that component if you need some more information from the store. For example, you need the host ID you can create your own component and return a drop-down item. So you can select um, data from the store, you can create the, a drop-down item and return that uh, as a component. Um, just uh, please notice that the numbers need to be, um, if, you, if you want you know, to group them together, um, you, need, uh, the, uh, you need the number to be um, you know, um, the weights, as you can see here, 101, 199. If you want, of course, to keep these items as one group, as you can see here, the extended button and two grouped together with a separator. Um, that's a small enhancement for the kebab dropdown. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ping me and I'll in the eye. Thank you, Amir. I don't see any questions at this time. Uh, so I will remind you all that there's another week and a half to get your ideas there for FormanCon. So please go and take a look, suggest ideas, or uh, vote on the existing ones. Thank you for all the presenters. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.